Today I'm continuing on with the series uh, looking at the Lord's Prayer point by point through the lens of different psalms. And this morning we're going to look at the next section of the prayer. Um, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we'll look at it in light of Psalm 119. You know, as, I, as I've worked through these passages over the last few weeks, it's kind of repeatedly occurred to me how personal these prayers are and how much they involve us as individuals. Um, they involve God, but they also involve and invoke a response from us. So our Father talks about our relationship with God. Hallowed be your name leads us to ask ourselves, what role do we have in making God's name be praised in the earth? And the same with your kingdom come. You know, it's about the king, but it's also about his subjects and what kind of subjects we're supposed to be. And then we come to today's uh, piece of the Lord's Prayer, your will be done as it is in heaven. What a nice prayer. God, may your will be done in earth that is, as it is in heaven. We can pray that and just kind of feel all warm and fuzzy inside. God, do whatever you have to do in order to bring about the day when your will will be done in the earth, just like it is in heaven. God, make this happen. Now, what's for lunch? But I think God, if he were to hear a prayer like that, would be like, whoa, 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 stop, stop. Back up, back up, back up, back up. You think I'm going to do that? How do you think my will being done on the earth is going to come about? Remember what Jesus said in the Great Commission, go into all the nations and make disciples of all peoples? You think he was talking to himself? That is how my will will be done, and that's as much your job, our job as it is God's. So just like the other pieces of the Lord's Prayer that we've looked at, this one's about God, but it also very much involves us. When we pray for God's will to be done in the earth, we're actually praying for God to come beside us and help us accomplish our job, the task that he has given us to do. Amen. But it gets us even more personal. You know, yes, we're, we're to make disciples of all nations, this grandiose vision of all tribes and tongues and nations bowing before God, giving homage to God, obeying God. Um, but you know, in that entire picture, there's really only one person's discipleship that we have control over, and that's us. You know, we can talk about the, the tribes and the tongues and the nations, but when it gets right down to brass tacks, there's only one person in that entire picture that we have control over, and that is us. So when we pray for God's will to be done, it expresses a desire that our community, our society, our country, our world will submit to God's will. But in making that happen and fulfilling our role in that, it starts with that one person that we have control over, us. So the answer to this prayer depends, uh, it, it isn't just about the people of the earth, it's also about us and our own relationship with God's will, so our own relationship to him. So this morning, I, I just want to unpack this phrase, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven, again, by examining it through the lens of Psalm 119. Now, those of you who know your Psalms realize that 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. Uh, it's like 176 verses. Don't panic. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, the nice thing about Psalm 119 is that it's composed of sections. Each section begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it starts with the letter equivalent A and then B and so on and so forth. And each of the sections are kind of similar. They have some differences, but they're kind of similar. Um, so I'm just, I'm just, this morning I'm just going to look at one of these sections, one of these chunks. Uh, and I've selected verses 57 through 64 as the text for today's message. So let's read that together. That's Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64. And I'll be taking, uh, I'm reading from the New International Version. You are my portion, Lord. I've promised to obey your words. I've sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. 
I've considered my ways and I've turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I'll not forget your law. At midnight I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I'm a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. This section breaks down really nicely into four subsections, each one of which contributes to the answer to this portion of the Lord's Prayer, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And verses 57 and 58 of this, uh, this section really tells us that God's will begins with our relationship with God. Have you ever had an, a friend or an acquaintance who only shows up when they need something? You know, you get this phone call, hey, old buddy, you know, I, I, I just can't believe, you know, it's been two years since we've talked and I miss you. How you doing? You okay? How's, how's the wife? How's the kids? Everything good? Hey, you still got that set of DeWalt cordless tools? You know, you ever known some people like that? Like, kind of the only time they show up is when they've got something that they want from us. Yeah, I think we, we all, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've all had that experience and, you know, it gets old fast. But, you know, sometimes I wonder how, how often God feels like that. You know, everything's great. We're kind of blissfully gliding through life, and then something knocks the pins out from under us. And, hey, God, wow, you know, it's been a while. Sorry. How you doing up there? And so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, this, this is known as seeking God's hand, and there's nothing wrong with that. God tells us to bring, us, to bring, his, to bring our requests to him to bring our needs to him, to look for him for healing, provision, and care. But that shouldn't define the extent of our activity with God. We don't want to reduce God to some kind of celestial piggy bank. Notice in these verses, the psalmist isn't seeking God's hand. He doesn't say that. He's actually looking for something else. You are my portion, Lord. I have sought your face with all my heart. You see, seeking God's face is different from seeking God's hand. Seeking God's face is a euphemism for desiring a relationship, for being friends, for building that relationship. You know, it reminds me of a small child, and you probably, I'm sure you've all seen this. You know, the small child hears his mother or his father's voice, and, you know, he's just on. He's looking around for the face of his or her parent. Uh, they just zero in on it when they hear the when they hear their parents speak. I run across an article in Parent Magazine that describes this. It says that it's well documented that babies are primed to seek out faces, with one recent study saying infants can process faces as well as an adult by just about four months. But it's the primary caregiver's faces they want to study the most. And this is the piece that stood out to me. The baby is sending signals that they want to attach. They want comfort. They want an emotional response back. You know, it's not just about food and diapers. Uh, when, we re uh, when we reciprocate and gaze back with affection, this builds a loving connection between you and the baby. That's, what, that's the idea of this seeking the face. It's that emotional, relational connection. This loving connection between us and our Heavenly Father is what seeking God's face is all about. And this is really what God's looking for us, uh, looking for with us. An active, ongoing relationship that is deeper than just getting our needs met. You know, we see this desire going all the way back to creation in Genesis 3, 8, and 9. After Adam and Eve, they've already sinned. They've already eaten from the tree. We read this. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said, Where are you? You know, it's really kind of a touching picture. God just kind of strolling through the garden, looking around for his friends, can't find them anywhere, calling out, Hey, where are you? And I think that's, that paints a picture of God simply wanting to be with us, wanting that kind of a relationship. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we seek God's face? You know, I think uh, a big part of it is to decompartmentalize our spiritual life. And what by that I mean, you know, many Christians set aside a time each day to spend with God. And that's good. 
I mean, we should, we should all do that. But the problem with that is that there's a temptation then to go back into the clamor of the day and all the activities and all the things we do and all the demands that are placed on us. And through the rest of the day, we just give little thought to God until the next day's quiet time comes along. That's what I mean by compartmentalizing our spiritual life. It's like we end up unintentionally, but we end up with, okay, this is God's peace and this is our peace over here. And the two don't interact much. I don't know if you've all read, there's, there's a book by a guy named Brother Lawrence, a classic spiritual, uh, spiritual book. He, this guy was a poor dishwasher and a cook in a 17th century French monastery. And during his 40 years there as a monk, he really developed a deep understanding of something he called practicing the presence of God. And after his death, his writings were gathered together and published in a book by that name, Practicing the Presence. In essence, he explains how he was able to integrate an awareness of the presence of God into virtually everything he did. As he was cooking, as he was cleaning, as he was bathing, everything that he did throughout his day, he was just connected mentally with God. And, uh, you know, as we do in our younger days, when I first read that book, I got all excited. I'm going to do this. And, you know, really tried hard for a number of weeks to, to do what he was talking about doing and discovered one thing about that. It's hard, you know, to, to focus on what we're doing. And it's almost like multitasking at the same time. You're, you're trying to make this connection with God throughout the day. It's really hard to do. And I could never get anywhere close to what brother Lawrence did. Um, but I think that's, that's a direction that we need to think about in our lives. As we talk about having a relationship with God is that kind of ongoing connection with God, maybe not continually, but throughout the day, just as we bring God into our lives, into what's happening, talk to him about it, and just involve him in that. You know, I think that's what Paul talks about when he talks about praying continually. It's that kind of a thing. It's not like we don't ever stop praying, but it's just this ongoing prayer that we offer up off and on throughout the day as we interact with God about our day. So your will be done on earth as it is in heaven starts right here with our relationship with God. That's the foundation. We lay the foundation. Everything else is built on that. And out of that foundation, out of this relationship, our lives are changed. Verses 59 through 60. I've considered my ways and I've turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. You know, I don't think it's any accident that the psalmist follows the verses about seeking God's face with this description of how his life has changed. In light of his relationship with God, the author considered his ways. He evaluated his life. And apparently, he didn't like everything he saw. And I say this because he indicates, notice in here, that he has turned his step to bring his life into alignment with God's statute. Turning implies change. He was going in one direction and realized on the basis of his relationship with God, that, yeah, I'm not quite there yet. I, there, there's some things here in my life that I need, to, I need to change, I need to address, I need to bring into alignment. So he, he needed a course correction, and that's what he's talking about. He did. Like I say, the, the order here is very important. First relationship with God, then course correction. You do the course correction without the relationship, what you get with that is Pharisees. You know, remember those are the guys who just totally lived for the law. Everything they did was about the law, following the law, following the commands. The time they get up in the morning, the time they went to sleep at night. Um, I think if you were to, if they were to describe themselves, they would have used the words of this psalm that they hastened to not delay to obey God's command. In fact, they were so fastidious about their obedience that they crucified the Messiah because they didn't have that relational yeah. component. They completely missed and misinterpreted what was God was doing right in their midst because they didn't have that relationship. So first, relationship, then course correction. But notice what happens when we get this right. In John 15, 1 through 4, Jesus presents us this amazing description. We've all read it many times about the vine and the gardener. I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. 
Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Remain in me, he says, and you will bear much fruit. How do we bear fruit? We bear fruit because God is pruning us. He's cutting off the useless pieces. He's essentially doing the course correction for us. As we, out of our relationship with him, as we understand his will and his purposes better, he's showing us those bits and pieces that we need to, we need to get rid of, and he's cutting them off for us. Bit by bit, he's changing our course. Remain in Jesus. God prunes. We bear fruit. Our relationship with God results in a changed and a productive life in him. Going up to the next section, verses 61 through 62, changed lives become strong, resilient lives. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I like that phrase, at midnight, I rise. You know, we might consider this to be a mark of devotion. Wow, what an amazing devoted follower of God this person is that, you know, he had set his, whatever the equivalent of an alarm clock is back then, he'd set his alarm clock and at midnight he'd get up and in the middle of the night he would take time to praise and praise God and express his thanksgiving. Well, I'd like to offer another interpretation, another possibility of what's actually happening, happening here. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I don't wake up much at midnight when things are going great. When things are going great, if I wake up, I go right back to sleep. When things are going great, I sleep like a baby. But when things are terrible, when I'm stressed, when I'm concerned, when I'm anxious, that's when I wake up at midnight and can't get back to sleep. Those are the times that I end up praying at midnight. And I'm guessing that's what the psalmist is talking about here. Because notice it. That statement about getting up at midnight comes right after his statement about the opposition of the wicked. I think the psalmist is stressed. He's worried. He's not sleeping. He has enemies who are actively working towards his destruction. He's woke up. He can't get back to sleep. And in the middle of his tossing and turning, his mind's going a million miles an hour. And he decides that in the midst of all of this, he's going to get out of bed and he's going to bring the situation to God. Notice that there's a progression here. Opposition brings his thoughts to the law of God. But by the law, I don't think he's just meaning the commandments and dictates. The law in Jewish thought referred to the whole Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Commands and dictates are part of that, of course. But along with those commands and the requirements and the things that God has asked, has asked them to do, there's also promises attached to that. That you do this, I'll do this. If you walk in obedience, in obedience, I will bless you. I'll take care of you. So the promises of God's presence and his active involvement are there in the law. So I don't think the psalmist is just offering up prayers of thanks for just the commandments. He's also offering up prayers of thanks for who God is and who he's promised to be and the extent of his promises that he's made to God, to his people. So the psalmist is faithfully following the God's law, following God's law. He's developed a relationship. He's seen the course correction. And uh, so he has a strong anticipation that God is going to respond just as he's promised. You know, just one passage among many in the law make this point that it's not just commands in the Old Testament. There's also promises attached. Uh, Exodus 19, 3 through 6. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, This is what you're to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you're to, to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you, and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my command, covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. It's with the promises like this in the Torah, in the law, it's, it's it with these in mind that the psalmist expresses his thanks to God in the midst of the opposition that he's, he's experienced, experiencing. He's saying, yes, I have enemies. Yes, I have problems. Yes, I'm not sleeping well at night because of all this. But God, you have promised to bring me through. You have promised never to leave me. You promised never to forsake me. You've promised to be my strength and my portion. See, there's power and strength in thanksgiving in this kind of an attitude. 
you know, as, as I was preparing this message this week, I came across an article in the Wall Street Journal that discusses this. Thank the, you know, kind of the power of thankfulness and the way it can affect our lives. Um, and notice that the psalmist isn't just rising at midnight to pray. He's rising at midnight to express thanks. And this article uh, talked about research that revealed the effect of gratefulness on people. And let me just quote a short passage. Research shows that gratitude is a huge psychological booster. Studies show that people who practice being grateful report significantly higher levels of happiness and psychological well-being than those who do not. They're less depressed with fewer and shorter episodes and have lower levels of stress hormones and reduced cellular aging. They sleep better, they have more success at work, and they have better relationships. You know, I thought it was interesting that our current scientific research, you know, the cutting edge stuff looking into this is affirming what the Bible has been telling us all along. Gratefulness brings strength and resilience. Ephesians 4, 6 through 7, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice the thanksgiving piece right in the middle of that that produces the peace of God, transcending all understanding. So we've built a relationship with God. We're seeking, or we're seeing his work in our lives. He's bringing our lives more in line with his expectations. That brings us confidence in his ongoing presence and work in our lives. We can praise him and thank him even in the middle of trials and tribulations because we know that he's there beside us, guiding, strengthening, and protecting, fulfilling his promises. He's working out his will in our lives. And that brings us to the final section. Change, strong, resilient lives affect the lives of others. In verses 63 through 64. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. And I love that last statement. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. I like it because it connects so much to the Lord's Prayer. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The earth being filled with God's love is the answer to that prayer. And this is how that prayer, it, the prayer in the Lord's Prayer, this section, you, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is how it's going to be answered. God's will comes about as we build relationships with others, as we share his word with them, as we see them grow in obedience and discipleship, as they take control or give control of, to God of their own lives, you know, the one thing that they control and grow in their discipleship. So God has called us to take the gospel to the nations, and ultimately that is his will. So when we pray that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying for the ongoing expansion of his kingdom. And we're praying that he would use us in that. You know, to be useful, however, to be able to bear much fruit, going back to the John passage I read earlier, requires, first of all, like I say, a strong relationship with the Father. Out of that, God prunes us. He transforms us in the likeness of Jesus. He makes that course correction. And as our lives become more in line with his will, we have the confident expectation that he'll fulfill his promises to us, that he'll be with us in good times and bad, that he will strengthen and use us to accomplish his purpose in spite of any opposition and hardship. And then we can be used by him to bring about the answer to this section of the Lord's Prayer, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know, ultimately, we are the means by which, that, by which God is going to answer that prayer, working in our quiet little corner of the Midwest as we influence our family and our friends and our community. This prayer will be answered. Let's pray. God, we thank you uh, that uh, you've already showed us in Revelation that, you know, one day this prayer, it will be answered, that every tribe and tongue and nation will stand before your throne will praise you, will confess their devotion to you, and will honor you, Lord. And we look for the day when that happens. There's still so many groups in this, in this world who don't know you, who have had no opportunity yet to uh, transfer their allegiance to you, Lord. And we just pray for them. We pray that uh, one day they will hear and they will obey. And we pray for each one of us, Lord, that in, our, in the areas where we are, in the families, in the social networks where we live, that you would help us to be faithful 
in representing the love of Jesus in our own lives and to others, and that you would help us to be effective in being the answer to our own prayer. That, Lord, your will will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So we pray this, God. We thank you again for this opportunity this morning to be together. We just pray your blessing on all of our mothers, and uh, we pray that this will be a great day for them, Lord. And uh, just look forward to this week that you've given us. Help us to walk in conscious un uh, understanding and awareness of your presence as we go through the lives that you've given us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.